Hello everybody, this is David Gregg for ADA 6400 Co-Occurring Disorders and this is the first segment of my recording for Lecture 1. Um, I may have to splice this video in parts because this is a fairly large uh, video or a fairly large um, lecture so I'm just going to do my best to try and get this all in one go but I may have to splice it up so hopefully it won't be too um, difficult for everyone to follow along. Be sure to keep in mind that um, once you're done watching this, there are lecture responses at the end of each lecture, so make sure to check that out. Very brief, very simple, just give me some kind of response to this overall lecture based on what I asked for at the end. There are a couple different things I just want you to list out in reviewing what I cover here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this. I'm just covering the covered readings and a couple extra details that I want to make sure that you all get from reading the uh, from your readings and as you go through this course. Before I jump into things in too much detail, I want to show the textbooks. Here's the Atkins textbook, so make sure you have this one. This is one's especially important for the beginning parts of the class. A lot of the initial readings would come from this one. And then there's this other textbook here. This is the Daly and Moss textbook. Um, this one will be particularly important for later on down uh, in the course uh, for later readings. Uh, like I said, this one is the Atkins one. I don't think I mentioned that's the author for that one. Another thing I really want to make sure to um, advise here is that since we're doing a lot of diagnostic work in this course, you want to get either one or the other of these, or the full DSM-5 published in 2013, or this little pocket reference DSM, which has, it's cheaper and it has just kind of the information you need. I'm going to be most um, interested in seeing you use and report specific symptoms. So I want those symptoms to be things that you will see in the DSM-5 when it comes to diagnosing different mental health disorders. So that aside, let me go ahead and get into this. Nosology of mental illness, I think it's just really important to be able to have a good understanding of how these different disorders are um, identified. How are they categorized? Where did this all come from, right? The idea of different mental health disorders. We've gone through five different DSMs. This most recent one, DSM-5, was created in 2013. Basically, the way they do this is a bunch of experts sit down, they review all the research, all the different survey um, and other clinical um, assessments that they have done over time, and determine what types of symptoms tend to occur together. Right? Which ones tend to co-occur and create what we consider a profile or some sort of syndrome of symptoms that happen all at once. That's how we kind of ended up with things like depression. What, does, what happens when somebody has depressed mood? What else happens for most people, right? So this is all based on statistics, basically. What do people most often report happening at the same time? That's how we come up with profiles of symptoms for people. Once these patterns are deemed to be clinically significant, maladaptive, problematic, or prevalent enough, we can consider them disorders. And really, it's just a bunch of experts deciding what things come together to make a diagnosis. So diagnosis details, there are universal criteria. Um, uh, well, basically, so what's going on here is there's uh, several things that are important to almost any diagnosis. Um, Symptoms of any diagnosis typically have to cause some form of clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of life. So keep that in mind. Though most of these disorders have a symptom of uh, a, a list of symptoms, you also need to see some kind of impairment going on. They have to be significantly affected by this disorder in a way that limits their ability to do certain things or causes them a lot of anxiety or distress. No disorders would be better explained by an existing medical condition, medication, substance intoxication, or another similar mental health disorder. So keep that in mind too, right? Um, we want to find the best fit diagnosis. And because this um, class is all about co-occurring disorders, um, we want to be able to know does a particular set of symptoms fit better for um, a substance use or a mental health symptom. So we want to make sure to have the right um, the right diagnosis that best explains what we see. When it comes to incomplete diagnoses, there are two things you can do. You can either list as an other or other specified or unspecified. Other specified basically just means you see a pattern of symptoms here, you just don't see enough to call it a major mental health or substance use disorder. For instance, you may see symptoms of depression, but maybe the person hasn't reported those uh, symptoms over the required duration of time 
to be considered depression. If you know exactly the reason why a uh, pattern of symptoms doesn't meet a specific mental health disorder, that's when you use other specified. Just make sure to, um, when you use that particular um, diagnosis, that you explain exactly why the criteria wasn't met. An unspecified um, diagnosis simply means that you're not exactly sure why it doesn't meet the criteria, so you're not saying why. These can be very helpful for if you are trying to determine some kind of supplementary condition that you're not sure about. But just so you know, you can't really use these particular conditions um, on their own because most insurance will not accept these as billable for services. So um, just keep that in mind that you still do need some kind of actual um, uh, complete diagnosis before you can use something like one of these uh, other specified or unspecified diagnoses. Another thing very important to keep in mind is that the, uh, the DSM-5 offers specifiers. Um, like I was saying before, most mental health conditions, you know, people are individuals, right? We can't all just be labeled or given one label to describe a condition when we're complex, right? And one where the DSM-5 tries to um, really accommodate for the complexity of humans is by adding these specifiers. When you review the DSM-5, you'll see more what we mean by these specifiers. This is basically a subcluster of symptoms that you can fit alongside a primary diagnosis. For instance, you may have what a one specifier is with anxious distress. <clears throat> so you can diagnose somebody with major depressive episode that includes anxious distress. This could be a very useful way of avoiding that whole incomplete diagnosis thing I was talking about, right? If you have a primary diagnosis, you see enough symptoms, duration, everything matches up to be depression, but you also see symptoms of anxiety that doesn't quite reach a full separate diagnosis, then you include anxious distress. The DSM will include more of the specifics behind a lot of these specifiers, what constitutes for a specifier in the book. What's also important to keep in mind is not every disorder has all of the same specifiers available to it. Um, so make sure to review the DSM-5 to determine what kind of specifiers you can use to supplement which specific mental health disorders. So good thing to keep in mind so that you can create a more comprehensive diagnosis. Other changes from DSM-4 to DSM-5, you know, I can't include this as more of a historical reference, just to keep in mind um, the thinking as these different disorders have evolved. One really important thing to keep in mind is that they've added gambling disorder. That wasn't in there before. They're, not, they're starting to really consider behavioral disorders more now in the DSM-5 than in prior. So we're going to have to see how that plays out, right? How does the behavioral disorder uh, fall in line with a substance use disorder? There's more that they're thinking about, like internet or pornography addiction. They may come down the road as well. They removed abuse and dependence from the DSM-5. Those used to be criteria, or those used to be um, disorders in the DSM-4. They don't deal with that anymore. Now it's just substance use disorder. You can also diagnose someone with intoxication or withdrawal from the substance. Um, they've also added cannabis and caffeine withdrawal too. So they've actually over time realized, oh, I guess marijuana does have withdrawal symptoms. So now they have that as a condition you can diagnose too. Very important so that you can actually distinguish between what phase of substance use someone's in. Are they in active use? Are they actually intoxicated when you are seeing them? Or are they maybe going through the withdrawal symptoms? These are important things to keep in mind. They've removed recurrent legal problems. Now all you really need to use, and I'll show these symptoms later, which is repeated use in dangerous situations. They don't want to get legal when it comes to the diagnosis. So really, if you're thinking that you see a lot of drinking and driving, well, that's use in a dangerous situation, use or intoxication, that is. Um, they've added the symptom craving to the substance use disorder list of symptoms, which I'm surprised wasn't in there before. Maybe it's just because they didn't feel like they had good justification for measuring or acknowledging this internal um, urge people experience to use, but it's in there now. I think it's been very helpful to have it in there. Important to keep in mind are the criteria for remission. No symptoms present except for cravings. That's the basics of it. It can either be early, which is the first three to 12 months that you're experiencing no symptoms. It's considered sustained remission once you get to 12 months or more of not experiencing any of the symptoms except cravings. Um, if you want to know more about the challenges of diagnoses, 
This is a book that I've thrown in there that I find to be very useful. Basically, this book talks about um, the, uh, the dilemma between diagnosing everything as a mental health disorder versus giving us enough space to diagnose people so we can treat them, right? We don't want to think of everything as a disorder. Human beings go through a lot of natural, expected, and important suffering and hardships to their lives. Do we want to label all of these things that people experience as a disorder? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe it helps just that we can then give them the option of having treatment. But maybe some people don't want to be branded or labeled as somehow disordered when they may just be reacting naturally and healthy to a dif difficult life. So here's all the symptoms of a substance use disorder. Keep these in mind, become familiar with these. Um, very important just to be able to look this over right here and um, see the pattern of these symptoms. Also keep in mind that once you get these symptoms down, this is inclusive of any and all substance use disorders. So this can actually be a very useful thing to be very familiar with so that down the road, whatever substance use you're looking at, you can come back to these same symptoms and decide whether or not they meet criteria for this. Um, increased consumption, desire to quit or cut down without being able to do that uh, successfully. A considerable amount of time either obtaining or recovering some substance, uh, the substance's effects. You know, experiencing cravings or urges to use. Um, uh, I'm not going to run through all of these specifically, but then we also have the bottom half, tolerance, which is needing more of the substance to get the same effect, and withdrawals, uh, which is um, basically a, a, a spectrum of symptoms that occur when you stop using a particular substance. Keep in mind that there are severity levels. Mild is two to three symptoms, moderate is four to five of these symptoms, and severe is six or more. There's a bit of a conundrum to this when you think about it, right? Um, just two symptoms to reach a substance use disorder? Well, is that enough, really? When you think about it, some of these symptoms are more severe than others as well. Like when you think about it, um, continued use despite health or emotional concerns. What if you've been drinking all your life and your liver just suddenly shut down? Well, that's pretty severe, right? Does that person stop using when they know that this drinking is causing a health problem? You're pretty sure someone has a major problem drinking if they're still drinking after their liver shuts down, right? That may be a lot more obvious than some of these others. Um, so important to also keep your clinical hat on when you think about this. And what I mean by that is you have to also consider is this causing significant distress or impairment to the individual? Very important to keep that in mind and how you measure that isn't always easy, right? How do we determine if somebody is impaired in some particular aspect of their life? Is getting their driver's license taken away enough to consider somebody to be impaired somehow? We have to ask ourselves these questions because the DSM-5 doesn't really fill all that type of information in. I'm going to pause this video right now and start up on a uh, part two to make sure that I'm doing these videos adequately and that it's saving on my software correctly. So we'll pick up on part two in a second here.